Life gets rough sometimes. Life gets hard. But Father, we thank, we're thankful that you were there for us. You will never leave us or forsake us. You are faithful. When we are faithless, you are still faithful, Lord. Would you be in this place today? Help us to draw closer to you, Lord God, so you can draw closer to us. Father, I offer myself as a vessel to speak your word. Holy Spirit, would you fill me and speak through me? Let not one false word proceed out of my mouth. Let it be only your truth and what you desire to communicate to your people today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Well, first of all, how many of y'all were actually praying for them when the pastor was praying? How many of y'all got caught praying for the actors when he was praying? Don't you lie. You know you were. How many of y'all put your hands out towards him and started praying? You know you did. Okay, I did too. I was like, amen, amen. Oh, wait a minute. This is a, this is a play. But how many of y'all have felt like Mr. Bronson over here? You're doing everything you can. You're doing your very best. But it seems like all hell keeps breaking loose no matter what you do. And it seems like it's not just an isolated incident, but it happens over and over, and you're just in this huge wilderness. A huge wilderness. We find ourselves there so many times in this life. And I want you to know today that it is not on accident. It's not always because you've done something wrong, but it is just a part of our journey with the Lord. A wilderness experience is a part of our journey, and it's okay, and it will be okay. There's tough decisions that need to be made. There's tough things that we have to go through sometimes. But I want to talk to you for the next couple of weeks about getting out of the wilderness. This series is called Out of the Wilderness, because while we enjoy the development that happens there, how many of y'all love being there? Anyone? You know, uh, no disrespect to any of God's creation or any of the different environments that we, that we have here on planet Earth. I just don't believe that some of them existed before the fall. For example, the desert. <laughs> now, if you love the desert, praise God. We, we, we accept, you know, all of God's creation and, and the beauty that you can find in it. But I remember driving to Las Vegas one time. You know, my, my uh, wife's father and stepmother lived there. You know, it's a very long journey, and we're driving through. And, you know, you get that one stretch where it's like, oh, my gosh, if I broke down right now and no human being came by for the next 24 hours, I'm dead. What are you, you going to do? There's no water. There's nothing. You are in a desert. And we were driving through one time and, you know, talking about how, you know, things are, are beautiful. And, and then my wife was like, you know, I just don't find the desert beautiful. It reminds me of death and, like, destruction and nothingness and loneliness. And I was like, yeah, it does. I said, but, you know. There's, there's some people that find the desert beautiful. She said, yeah, there's also some people that serve the devil. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, true that, true that. But the wilderness is not usually a place that you want to be in. Like, I am not going to choose to live in weather that's like 120 degrees and there's no water anywhere. That's just not something I would choose. So a wilderness is not something that we want to go through. But my hope and my desire is that by the end of this series and even by the end of today, that you would, you would have a sense of hope, a sense of purpose, and even an appreciation for the wilderness that you are in right now as we discover God's plan and purpose for it, because there is always a purpose for it. So we're going to examine different aspects and different principles of, of being in the wilderness as we go through these next couple weeks. Uh, I'm going to look at Moses and the Israelites today as a pattern for how to conduct yourself or maybe not conduct yourself in the wilderness and what God has for you to get out of it. Are you all ready today? Yes. Now, raise your hand if you feel like you're in a wilderness right now. <laughs> Glory. Raise your hand if you just got out of one. Raise your hand if you feel like you're entering into one. <laughs> This is something for everybody today. Praise the Lord. First thing I want you to know is there is a purpose for the wilderness. There is a purpose for it. And I, and, I, I, and I don't mean that there is a reason for it because we say, oh, everything has a reason. No, I mean that there is a purpose. That means that there is a planned, distinct thing that you are supposed to gain out of this wilderness experience. Um, we have message notes here. I'm sorry to take a break in this. We have message notes so you can follow along in the, in the service and, and know the scriptures and everything like that. So if you don't have those message notes and you would like some, would you raise your hand and our ushers and greeters will come by and, and, and give them to you real quick. 
Uh, I'm going to continue moving forward. Forgive me if I, uh, if I do that, but your, your neighbor will have the, the fill-ins there. First thing is this. The wilderness experience is a part of God's redemptive plan for your life. The wilderness experience is a part of God's redemptive plan for your life. What do I mean by that? Redemptive. What does redemption mean? It comes from the word redeem. It means that you are taking something from one place and paying the price for it to be somewhere else. When you are redeemed from something, it means that you owe something, and then someone comes in and they pay it for you, and then you can now move into the area that you're supposed to be in. The word comes from uh, back in the day when uh, people would, would lose their land because of debt, and it was their inherited land then someone, they, someone could come in and they could redeem that land. In other words, they could buy it back for them on their behalf. And they could redeem all things back to them, give them back what was rightfully theirs, but they lost it because of you know, misuse or, or whatever happened. So Jesus, we lost something here on this earth. Jesus came back to redeem us. But what we need to understand is that there is a process of redemption. While Jesus has, has finished the work on the cross, and through faith in Christ, we now have the assurance of eternity in heaven with him, there is also a part of the redemptive plan that isn't finished. How many of you guys can just take a look at the world today and realize God's not done with this place yet? There's more work that he is doing. And just as that is true in the world as we look around, that's also true in us. There's still more work that he is doing. So we have been redeemed and are being redeemed all at the same time. And the wilderness is part of that process. Every single person that was mentioned in the Bible went through a wilderness. Not one person did not go through a wilderness that did anything significant for the Lord. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Samson, Jesus, Gideon, you cannot find one person. So if they went through a wilderness, guess what? That probably means that you're going to go through a wilderness. And not just one. There will be several. Let's take a look at Moses. Moses, he went through a wilderness right when he was born. He was young, and they had to put him in an ark and send him downstream to be found by the Egyptians and by the royal family and brought in. He had to go through a little wilderness there. Guess what? When he was older, he recognized the affliction of his people, stood up for one of them, and killed an Egyptian. And he had to run and flee, lest he be killed himself. And he went into a wilderness. He went into the wilderness for 40 years he was there. 40 years he was in the wilderness learning how to tend sheep, how to manage a flock. And then God appeared to him. And then he sends him only to go back to Egypt. And there's a great deliverance that happens. And then guess what? He's now back in the wilderness. My goodness. You know, when he went over there, he was 80 years old. I know in all the movies and all the cartoons, he's like some young strapping 25-year-old. This brother was 80 years old when he went back to Egypt to deliver the people. And then he had to spend another 40 years in the wilderness because the people were out of their mind. And then he died in the wilderness. Are y'all encouraged? I'm sorry. I'm just telling the truth. <laughs> but listen, there were great things that happened in the wilderness. And let me explain a little bit more about this redemptive plan. And we see it in the life of Moses. First of all, there's uh, deliverance. You get delivered from something. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, it says this, He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. Man, so there's deliverance. I guess a, a better term would be rescuing. Jesus comes in and he rescues us. Sometimes we don't even know we need to be rescued. But he comes in and he rescues us and he takes us out of that bad situation. He takes us out of that lifestyle. He pulls us away from sin that tries to pit us against our God and hold us ransom. He became ransom and he rescues us out of, us, out of that. So we get delivered. Then there's baptism. You get baptized. We're having baptisms today. Baptism means that you now enter into a new life with him. You identify with his death, burial, and resurrection, and now you are baptized. Moses and those people, they were baptized, the Bible says. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 2, it says, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. In other words, you know when the, when the Red Sea parted and they all walked through in the midst of it? That was a type and shadow of baptism. They passed through and were immersed 
in the water and came on to the other side. They were baptized as part of the redemptive plan. Next part is the wilderness. The wilderness. They go into this desolate place. Wilderness simply in the, in the Hebrew means an open, wide area. An open, wide area. That's just what it, what it means. And it's usually referred to people who take out their, their sheep to pasture or their herds to pasture. That was the, the most common term for it. In the Greek, in the way it's used in the, in the New Testament, it means a desolate place, a desert, also associated with loneliness, isolation, no one else there. That's the wilderness. What possible good can come from being in a wilderness? Why on earth would God bring us to a wilderness? Then that's even, I mean, God, can't we just be like saved? And then we just go into paradise. And there's like, you know, we run and we sing and we play and everything's wonderful. And no, he's like, no, you're going to go through the wilderness first. And you're like, oh, man. Well, let's, let's take a look at why he brought the children of Israel into the wilderness. Because in, in, in order to fully understand this, we need to remember where they came from and what was in them. First reason is that the Bible says is that he wanted to teach them. The wilderness is a place of teaching. It's a place where you learn. In Exodus 18.20 says, And you shall teach them, this is the Lord speaking to Moses, And you shall teach them the statutes and the laws and show them the way in which they must walk and the work they must do. They came out of Egypt. They came out of a completely different lifestyle. 400 years in slavery. 400 years being in a pagan society. And don't think that if you spend that much time in that society, stuff isn't going to get in you and get on you. There are some things that need to be cleansed and washed. They didn't even know how to worship God. That was one of the things that he taught them. He, he taught them how to worship God. They came out of Egypt where they had all these idols and all these things that they worshiped and bowed down to and all these weird rituals that they were around for so long. He brought them out to the wilderness. He had to teach them. He's like, this is how you worship God. I mean, what is the first thing they do? They get out of the wilderness. They cross the Red Sea. They see all the plagues and everything. Woo, praise God. Moses disappears for a little bit too long. Like, let's build an idol. Quick. We don't know what to do. Quick, get some gold and build an idol. So they build a golden calf. Of all the things to build... To worship, they built a cow. I was like, "Come on, get a lion, a tiger, or something fierce and uh." But no, we're gonna worship a cow. That's the best we can do right now. So they get everybody's earrings and all this stuff, and they build a cow, and they say, "Behold, O Israel, this is the God that delivered you." A cow. They had no creativity, but they were trying to worship God. It wasn't that they were evil in their heart. They had just been in Egypt so long that they thought, this is what I do to worship God. This is how I honor God. I build a golden calf, and I bow down to it, and we have debauchery. Isn't that what you do to worship God? And Moses comes down, and because the Lord sends him, he's all, you better, the Lord says, you know when you, you have kids, and all of a sudden they, you know, when they're acting up, they become your children? God's like, hey, Moses, your brethren are down there acting a fool. You better get down there. Moses comes down sees what they're doing. He takes the two tablets that God gave him and he throws them down in his anger and then takes that golden calf, bashes it into, into dust, grinds it up and then makes them drink it. I don't know what he was trying to do there. There's some deep revelation in there, but he made them drink it. And then people lost their life that day because they tried to worship the Lord in an old way. So he had to teach them, teach them how to worship the Lord, teach them the law of God. See, the law of God is not just the do's and don'ts. The law of God represents his character, his likes and dislikes. When you get to know somebody, you start to figure out their likes and dislikes and, and how they operate, and, you know, and, and then you get to build a relationship with them. So he had to teach them those things so they can get to know their God. They didn't really know him. Next, and this is, this is the one that's not as comfortable. He sent them there to trouble them. What? He sent them there to trouble them. That word trouble also means humble, to humble them. Deuteronomy 8.2, it says, And you shall remember the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you. To humble you. See, they, they were in Egypt. And man, even though they were slaves, they're like, it wasn't too bad. We got three squares a day. We knew what work we had to do. We didn't have to wonder about anything. It wasn't too bad. God had to get Egypt out of them. 
and he had to humble them. He had to teach them that they could trust him. See, humility is really about trusting God. Pride tries to take care of everything yourself. Humility says, oh, God's already taken care of it for me, and I can rest and rely on him. They didn't know how to rely on him. So they're wandering through the desert. Moses, where are we going to get something to eat? God gives them manna. Everybody's like, oh, I want manna from heaven. I don't know if you all wanted manna. It was like eating crackers and honey all day, every day, every single day. You guys ever had your uh, top ramen season in life, macaroni and cheese season in life? I remember our macaroni and cheese season when, when I was a kid, we, but we got creative with it. We had tuna mac, chili mac, regular mac, plain mac, all kind of mac <laughs> up in there. We diversified. And then on Tuesday night, we would go to McDonald's because they had hamburgers for 25 cents. So we would save up all week, and then we'd go up to McDonald's, and you, you could only buy 10 at that time. So we'd take like all eight of my brothers, we'd walk up there and stand in separate lines, and we'd come back with 80 hamburgers, and that was like, <laughs> woo, yes, <laughs> glory to God. We had those seasons. And then Top Ramen, man, you get the beef flavored, you get the shrimp flavored, you get the chicken flavored. It's not the same thing. It's just a little bit. But that's, that's a wilderness season, y'all. They were in a wilderness. They were having top ramen time. That's what manna was. But God teach them, taught them that you don't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. They had to learn and be humbled and trust that God was going to take care of them. They drank water. Moses, where are we going to get water? Out of a rock. Huh? Yes, I'm going to use unusual sources to bless you and sustain you in this wilderness. Speak to the rock. And the water came out, and they were sustained. They got to learn to trust God. Man, God can make water come out of a rock. He can make food come out of nothing. And he's like, and by the way, I don't want you to save the food. He said, I want you to trust me every day. See, what they did was when the manna would come in the morning, they would try and hoard it up. And be like, well, just in case he doesn't give it to me tomorrow, I've got extra. And they would open it up the next day, and it was rotten and full of maggots. He's like, no, you're not saving anything. You're going to trust that I'm going to provide for you every single day. Remember the Lord's Prayer? Give us this day our daily bread. Daily. He wants to show you. He, doesn't want to, he, he didn't want them storing up a bunch of stuff because now they're relying on their storage. They're relying on their savings. They're relying on all these things. He's like, no, in this season, you're going to learn that I will take care of you no matter what. No matter what. I will sustain you in these times. And no one else can. Not even you yourself. He humbled them, removed their pride. Deuteronomy 8.16 reveals the third, to test them. It says, and that he might test you to do you good in the end. God tests you in the wilderness. God tests you in the wilderness. There's so many people like, man, once I make it big, once I get my contract, once this thing blows up, once I, once I do this or once I do that, man, watch out, world. God's like, Really? Let me test you in this wilderness. Are you serving me now? Oh, once, I, once this hits, God, I'm going to serve you with all my heart. Are you serving me now? Oh, once I, man, once I get a ton of money, watch all the people I'm going to help and bless. Are you helping and blessing people now? You're not going to do it when you get that stuff. The same excuses you got now for not doing it, you're going to have them then. So he's testing you. Not so he can know how you are. He already knows your heart. He knows you inside and out. He wants you to know your heart. He wants you to know where you stand. He wants you to know what's really going on inside of you. He wants you to step out of delusion and step into a place where you can be honest and be like, Lord, this is where I'm at. I'm not doing all that great right now, but I trust you. How are you going to know that unless he tests you? He's testing you, but we want to avoid it. We don't, we don't want to be taught a lot of times. We sure don't want to be troubled. We live in a society that pursues comfort more than all things. I purpose to pursue discomfort. Not that I try and bring it on myself, but if there's not some challenges going on in my life, then what am I really doing? If everything's just hunky door, I'm not in the fight. If you're not taking some shots, if you're not dodging some bullets, you're not in the fight. I'm a scrapper. I want to be in the fight. I want to I'm, make use of me. I don't want to run into heaven. I want to crawl and limp and be like, man, that was rough, man, but whew, we made it through, yeah. Right? That's like, that's like those brothers that go into like the NBA or the NFL or something like that, and they sit on the bench all singing and then get a ring if the team wins the championship. I don't want that. 
I don't want to be the guy who just kind of skated in and got a ring just because everybody else played well. Put me in, coach. But how are you going to get in if you haven't been trained and taught and humbled? You get no PT if you're not willing to go through it. See, isn't it amazing that you can go through this redemptive process? You can be saved but never get in the game? That's a scary thing to me. You can be saved, you can be rescued out of darkness, but spend your entire life wandering through the wilderness because you haven't been taught, you haven't been humbled, and you haven't passed the tests of this life. And then what happens is we start blaming the devil. Man, the devil just got me down. The devil's just doing this. Man, first of all, the devil doesn't talk that much. He's not trying to do all that stuff. And you give him way too much credit. You, here you are serving God, and then the devil can just come in and smack you around? It's like, what kind of... I'm like, if I'm standing right here, and my daughter's here, and somebody comes up and just starts smacking her around, I'm standing there, what kind of father am I? It's like, no, that's not the devil. Sometimes it's just our own pride, our own decisions, our own things that we're doing that are actually resisting God. But we're not going to do that anymore, right? We're going to grab hold of these things. Many who have been delivered and baptized find themselves wandering in the wilderness longer than they needed to. Everything that we just talked about in terms of teaching, humbling, and testing, the Lord did that within the first two and a half years of them being in the wilderness. Two and a half years. They were in the wilderness. That's how long it took for them to, to build the tabernacle and, and build the ark and learn how to worship God, get the priest in order. They traveled around. God was teaching them to obey him. I mean, once they built the tabernacle, the cloud of, uh, and the glory of God would rest on the tabernacle. And then when, when it would lift, they had to pack everything up. It was, like a, it was like a big tent revival every week. And then they would hang out there. And then when God's glory was there, they would stay. But when it lifted, they would pack everything up and then they would follow it. Sometimes they'd be in a place for like two weeks and then they'd be in a place for like two days, and God was just moving them around. They're like, where are we going? Why are we doing all this? I don't understand. Why, 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 why? Well, God's training you to move when he tells you to move. You don't, you don't need to understand why. Sometimes he's just moving you and shifting things. He trained them and taught them to be obedient. All this happened in the first two and a half years. Why on earth were they in there for 40 years? I want to give you the reasons for the extended wilderness plan that they put themselves on. <laughs> Anybody ever felt like they're on the extended wilderness plan? <laughs> like, wait a minute. Things seem to be going on a little bit too long. Like, you know, like, like I talked about earlier about driving to Vegas. I remember the first time I drove to Vegas, I was like, I, it could not possibly be this far. I must have missed something along. Am I still going? Still going? You, 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 and then there's so many streets out there. I don't know if you guys have seen this one. They just, they just lost names to name them. There's one that's like ZZYZX. When you're driving, anybody seen ZZYZX? It's like, Zizix? It's like, what kind of street name is that? Y'all ran it. That's how long this desert is. Don't even have names for it anymore. Man, what held them there? What gave them this extended stay? Number three, we're doing this. We're going to do the top three in reverse order. Number three, complaining. Mm hmm I felt shockwaves of conviction going out throughout the congregation. <laughs> Hallelujah. Complaining. Numbers 14.29 says, The carcasses of you who have complained against me shall fall in the wilderness, and all of you who were numbered according to your entire number from 20 years old and above. Lord said, You complained against me? You guys ever heard of just complainers? Everything is just like, wah, wah, wah. Man, oh, woe is me. And look, I'm not saying things ain't hard, but man, we got a bunch of crybabies. I'm just like, I can't even understand you. You sound like my three year old. Come on. Stop your whining and complaining. We don't have any food, Moses. Did you not see him just split the Red Sea? Why don't you just ask? We don't have any water. Well, Moses, you're not the only one that God talks to. He can talk to me, too. <laughs> Moses said, all right, go ahead. Fire! God burned him up. My goodness. I know this is <laughs> kind of harsh, 
but it's the truth. God's like, why are you complaining against me? Did you not see what I, do you not remember what I did for you? Do you not remember how I came in and I rescued you and I loved you unconditionally? I wiped away every tear and said, it's okay, I'm with you forever. Don't you remember that? Why are you complaining against me? Well, it's just, it's just that Egypt that's still inside of us. We want things our way. We want to know everything. We want to understand everything. And, and God's like, don't complain. Just say thank you. Can, we need to shift our perspective a little bit. The person who is having the hardest time in here right now, that doesn't compare to what's going on on the other side of the world right now. I am so thankful. We don't have to worry right now about someone running in here and trying to do something. We never have to worry about it. But the threat of that isn't real here. If we were having this meeting on the other side of the, of the world, all these ushers and greeters, they would be packing. They would be watching. They would be checking every purse. They would be patting down every single person. We would have secret codes to make sure that you weren't coming in trying to harm this place. We need to have a little perspective. I'm thankful. If, you, if you've had something to eat today, you've got a place to go home to, and you've got a little bit of money in your pocket, you're better off than 80% of the world. What have we to complain about? We have nothing to complain about. Be thankful. Shift your mindset from what you don't have to what you do have and give God the glory. Because guess what? It's not going to last anyway. Sooner or later, we up out of here and I'm going to heaven and every tear will be wiped away, every worry, every concern. And I'm looking forward to that to eternity. I'm not complaining about anything. Not a thing. We got to stop thinking about our comfort here. Number two, they tested God. Psalm 106, 14. But they lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tested God in the desert. What does that mean, to test God? They're doubting him. They're constantly doubting him. Man, oh, God, if you can just, if you would just, is God really going to, it would have been better if we died in Egypt, Moses. What? Well, go ahead, go back. Take yourself back to Egypt. They were so connected with what they had over there, and they were so insecure about what the unknown which laid uh, ahead of them, they would rather go back into slavery than move forward and trust God, and they doubted him. Man, I, I, I can just picture God being like, what else do you want me to do? I made food out of nothing. I made water out of nothing. I delivered you out of Egypt with great signs and wonders. Yo, that's my best, y'all. If y'all can do better, go right ahead. If Egypt's got better than that, then go, go right ahead. It got to the point where God said, Moses, those people are a bunch of stiff-necked, disobedient fools, and I'm not going with you into the wilderness. I'm going to stay right here, because if I go with you, I'm going to kill all y'all. I, I, I just can't deal with you guys. You all have just run me ragged. This is God. God said, I've got no more patience for that level of doubt and just craziness. And Moses was like, Lord, come on, you got to go with us. All the nations are going to be like God was strong enough to take him out, but he wasn't strong enough to take him out of the desert. And God was like, you know I was going to go with you. I just wanted to see, hear you intercede. I wanted to hear your heart, Moses. Okay, you know I'm going with you, but y'all still a bunch of stiff-necked, disobedient people who keep doubting me. But you know what? He loved them anyway. And he sustained them anyway, even though they tested him. Don't test God. Trust. Amen. It's not our job to test him. It's our job to trust him. He tests us. We trust him. Amen. That's how it works. And let me tell you, you can always trust him. Through the most difficult and hardest times of my life, he has never, ever let me down. And throw your hand up if you can say the same thing about him. Never, ever let you down. Never dropped the ball on me. Nothing. There may have been some times where I wish he would have showed up early. But you know what? I was in the wilderness. He was doing some stuff in me. He was tearing some stuff out that needed to go. So don't rush that. Lord, tear me apart and build me back up again because I'm not good enough the way I am. And you know best. You're dad. I trust you. Don't test. Trust. 
The last one here, and this is the big one. This is the big one that led them into that wilderness. God, even, even through all the mistakes that they made, testing him, there are people that, that lost their lives along the way. All the crazy stuff that they did to test God in the wilderness, he still took them to the edge of their promise. He still took them there. He's like, all right, y'all, it's time to go in. What was it that kept them from going into the next part of their redemptive plan and staying wandering in the wilderness for 40 years? Numbers 13, 33. What's happening here is they sent spies into the land, and there were, there were 12. Two of them were Joshua and Caleb. And they came back, and they looked at everything, and they said, it is ripe for the taking. Let's go take these fools out and gain our inheritance. Hoorah. <laughs> the other 10 were like, we can't do it. <laughs> what? There they go, testing and complaining again. And listen to what they say. There we saw the giants. The descendants of Anak came from the giants. And we were like grasshoppers in their sight? We were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. They didn't even realize how deep that comment was. We were grasshoppers in our sight, and so we were in theirs. The number one reason they didn't move forward with their redemptive plan was they had identity issues. They had identity issues. They couldn't see themselves as anything other than slaves. They still had so much Egypt wrapped up in their hearts and their minds, all they could see of themselves was we are grasshoppers. Just as we were weak in Egypt and feeble, so we will be weak in Egypt, uh, in the land that you promised us, God. We're not able. We're grasshoppers in our own sight. I think the number one thing holding Christians back today is we have identity issues. We have forgotten who we are. And the reason we forget who we are is because we have forgotten who he is. They never got to really know him in the desert. They never took the time to really understand who he was. Because when you know who your father is, the one who begot you, the one in whose image you are made, then now you know who you are. You guys remember The Lion King? Way back in the day? I love that movie. Poor Mufasa. But I remember, you know, Simba, he gets deceived into thinking that he was responsible for his father's death. And he runs through the wilderness. And he goes into the, into the wilderness, and he finds a warthog and a meerkat. And you got a warthog and a meerkat raising a lion. Definitely going to have some identity issues. <laughs> they have this lion eating grubs, worms. I don't know how you grow to 550 pounds eating worms as a lion, but it happened. It's Disney, you know. So they got him eating things that he's not supposed to eat, singing songs he's not supposed to sing. <laughs> Some of y'all need to hear that. <laughs> singing songs he's not supposed to sing, having a careless life, completely unassociated with who he really is. And then it takes Rafiki, the crazy baboon, to come and knock some sense into him. Literally takes a stick and just hits him over the head. But praise God, he has a vision. And his father speaks to him. And he says, Simba. Ooh, you remember that part? It just chills to go through you. Simba. You have forgotten who you are. He said, he's like, Dad, no, I haven't forgotten. He said, yes, you have forgotten me. Therefore, you have forgotten who you are. He says, return. Return. Be who you have been called to be. Be who I have created you to be. You are not a meerkat. You are not a warthog. You are not some grasshopper in your own sight. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people called and appointed. You have an inheritance to gain. 
And we sit back and we let the world just happen to us. We let Egypt stay inside of us rather than letting him wash us and purge us through teaching and training and testing so we can be who, everything he's called us to be. You have forgotten who you are. Remember. Remember what he delivered you from. Remember those things that he's brought you out of. Remember, he said you're made in my image. Remember the promise that he gave you. Do you guys remember the promise that God gave you? And I don't mean what he spoke just in his word, but I mean when he spoke to you personally. What did he tell you? Have you forgotten? Have you counted him too weak to perform it? Have you thought yourself too small to accept it? Remember who you are. See, it isn't until we remember who we are and we allow Egypt to be purged out of us, then we are able to go in and take true possession of what is ours. The next part of your redemptive plan is this. Once you have been trained and taught, humbled and tested in the wilderness, next comes empowerment. The Lord empowers you. Luke 4.14 says that Jesus came out of the wilderness in the power of of the Holy Spirit. Jesus went through this same process, y'all. No one is exempt, but he came out in power. When you have been tested and tried and make it through, he gives you power. He says, now I see what is in your heart. Now you have remembered who you are. And when you begin to act like a king and a queen, rather than a slave, now you can take possession. And that is the last portion. You possess. You take dominion. Most believers never get to this part, though. We are so obsessed with our own comfort that we deny the wilderness experience, pretend we have power, and then suffer trying to possess what we know is ours, but we can't reach. It's because you haven't been strengthened, you haven't been properly positioned. We haven't allowed the wilderness to come in and take those things out. You know what happened to that generation that refused to go in? They all died. There is something in us that still needs to die. And God is waiting on us. He's like, will you let it die in the wilderness? Leave it there. Let your past go. Let it die. That is not who you are anymore. Look forward to what I've called you to be. Who did I tell you you are? I never told you you were a grasshopper. Who put that in your mind? Who told you that? Is that something you learned in Egypt? Let it go. Look at yourself the way I see you. You have no idea how much is in you. There is so much latent power laid up inside of you that is yet to be tapped in. You're a deep well, ready to explode. But we've got to let him come in. When you want to tap into a well, you got to drill deep. I wonder how many people have gone to dig for a well, but never dug deep enough. you got to go a little bit further, a little bit deeper, a little bit more. And then all of a sudden, boom, you hit it. And springs of living water will rush out of your inner man and spill over into the lives of others. And they cry out, what must I do to be saved? The power is not so that you can go out and spend it on your own pleasures. And the promise is not that you have that wonderful car or that big house or any materialistic thing. The promise is that God would live inside of you and live through you and you would impact the lives of other people. That you would walk into a room and people would be like, something just changed in here and I need to find out what did it. That's the promise. Christ in you, the hope of glory. You ever thought about what that means? The Bible says that Christ in you, the hope of glory. It means that when people look at you and they see Christ, they get hope of glory. This is what I can become too. If this is who you are, perhaps God also has that for me. 
That's our true power, the ability to represent God, to be an ambassador here and draw people into fellowship with the Father, the power to love people in a way that would draw them into the family of God, the power to have dominion over our own flesh and to let God live out his life through us rather than just settling for what we know. Isaiah 43, 19 says this, Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. The Lord is trying to drill down deep into your life, and there is a deep wellspring waiting to explode. He said, now. He said, shall you not know it? In other words, no one's going to have to tell you what's happening. No one's going to have to guess what's happening. No one's going to have to tell you or God is here. You're going to know. I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Come on. If you're in a wilderness right now, let me tell you, don't be discouraged. Don't be upset. Well, I'm in a wilderness right now. I haven't been able, I've been looking like crazy. I can't find a job. That's all right. Trust God. Put your hands to something. Don't just sit there waiting for the promised land. There's some training that needs to happen. Put your hands to something. I'm in a wilderness right now with my relationship and my marriage. Don't worry about it. Do what God said. Trust God. Love your wife. Cherish her. Tell her she's beautiful. Honor and respect your husband, even if he acts like a knucklehead. Treat him like a king and help him remember who he is. I'm in a wilderness right now in my emotions. There's a sadness. There's a depression that's there. Well, the only reason we feel that is because we've forgotten who we are. You're not depressed. You're not sad. You have joy unspeakable. You are the child of a king. You have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. Rivers of living water ready to come out. Remember who you are. We need to get our identity back so we can hurry up and get up out of this wilderness. Amen. Let's bow our heads.